Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He already got it started. Yeah. Yeah. My Lord. So last week we uh, talked to you about A man who had been looking for a miracle for 38 years. Laid by a pool. Waiting on a man to come save him. And then when the man walked up who could save him, he didn't even know it. <laughs> Today I want to do something a little bit different. Another Bible story I think you're familiar with, hope you're familiar with it. I think this is probably one of the more familiar Bible stories that we learn. But I want you to look at it from a little different perspective. If I ask you just by a show of hands, who knows the story that's found in 1 Samuel chapter 17? Probably nobody would raise their hand. Although this story comprises the entire chapter, just about. Now those Old Testament chapters are wordy. A lot of words in them. And I'm not testing you right now. You don't have to prove your Bible knowledge by saying you know what 1 Samuel chapter 17 is. But if I say to you, how many of y'all know the story of David and Goliath? Raise your hand. Yeah, see, we know that. Yeah. David and Goliath. It's a powerful story. Let's, let's look at it just a little bit different. There are 50 some odd verses in that chapter, and I certainly wouldn't stand here and try to read them to you. But I do want to pull some of them out and see if we can look at David's adventure, David's activity that day, just a little bit different, but, but, but by way of background, by way of background. Some things about the story you may not you may not know. First of all, the place that they fought is an actual place. See, I think sometimes we look at these stories in the Bible, and I tell 45th Street all the time, that we only look at them one dimensionally. And we don't look at them as an actual place that you can get on a plane and go to from here right now. You can get on a plane and actually go to the valley of Elah, where this fight took place. And I think some of the things that happened in the Bible are so amazing that we can't believe they actually happened. We, we almost think they're fables just because they defy what we currently understand about life. And so today I came to tell you, to me, I don't have a problem with the David part of the story. I got a problem with the Goliath part. All right. okay. yeah. Until I started doing more research on the Goliath part, who could be that big? 
that everybody was afraid of him. Till I started doing some research and, and you know we got big people now. <laughs> oh, oh, we do. They might not be big in the Goliath realm, but there's some pretty big folk right now around here. Now, according to Guinness World Records, the, the, the tallest one we've ever seen was a guy in, in modern history, was, was recorded in 1940, a guy who was 8 feet 11 inches tall. We don't even build systems in our buildings to handle people that tall. 8 feet 11 inches tall. But the Bible says that Goliath was between 9 and 12 feet tall. That's a lot of Happy Meals <laughs> to feed him. You just can't feed him every day. I mean, every time you look at him, he hungry. But this is who we're talking about. Why, why am I saying this, Reverend Sparks? Why do you even go into the story this way? Because sometimes your giant is that big. Sometimes your giant is so unbelievably big that nobody can believe they can beat that giant. Yeah, he's not your average giant. He ain't no shack size giant. Just saying that because Shaq coming this week to Birmingham. And so we can believe somebody can be that big. He ain't no Zion Williamson size. See, these are some big folk, bigger than the average folk. So let's look at how David, y'all know the story, right? David and Goliath, you know the backstory. David's just at home doing what he does. He's already been anointed as the future king of Israel. The prophet has already come and laid eyes on him. We already been through that story about how David was tending his father's sheep. That's the job nobody wanted. Amen. And because nobody wanted it, he was insignificant. And so much so that when they had the biggest party of the year at the house, when the prophet came, they didn't even invite David. In fact, they forgot him. They forgot he was down there until the prophet looked at every one of the father's children, and he said, isn't there another one? So there's some children in here who feel like they were the one who were always overlooked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your mama went and bought four meals for everybody, but forgot she had five children. <laughs> Just forgot. You always felt like you were that child that was overlooked. That's David. That's enough to give you a complex. Even a child who's already been anointed as the future king of Israel can still have a complex because he's been overlooked. And so his daddy calls him up one day because there's been a war going on. I put a graphic up about where it was happening. I want to show you the actual Valley of Elah with the Philistines camped on one side and Israel camped on the other side. There was a lot going on. There was a war going on. And David's brothers, the three eldest brothers, had been sent out to fight for Saul. They were devoted to King Saul. And so they went to fight the Philistines, but there wasn't no, there wasn't no fight going on, y'all. There was no fight going on because everybody on the side of the Israelites was afraid. And so the mightiest man on the side of the Philistines issued a, a challenge. They called him the champion. He came down into the valley. Came down into the valley and he issued a challenge. And he said, let's do this. I'll represent the Philistines. And then you select a champion to re represent the Israelites and we'll fight. And if I win, then all your folk become our slaves. And if you win, then we'll lay our arms down and we'll become your slaves. He issued a challenge. And for 30 days, came out and issued the same challenge. 
30 days of making the Israelites look like punks. Not one came out to see what was going on. Not one had the courage to get up and go out there and challenge this man. His name was Goliath. Goliath. Not one of them went out. Day after day after day of humiliation, they sat there, and it just so happened during the time that this was going on, David was sent by his father, who did not know what was going on at the front line. He said, David, go up there and take these supplies to your brother and see what's going on at the front line, and then come back and tell me. That's all David was doing. David wasn't looking to get into nothing. That's my first point for you. Sometimes you just walk into a conflict. Sometimes you just walk into a conflict. You're not looking to get in anything. I ain't, as I tell them at the house all the time, I ain't bothering nobody. I'm just sitting here doing my thing. I ain't messing with nobody. And David comes up there to bring the supplies to them. And when he comes to bring the supplies, he walks up and he hears this, as he said, this uncircumcised Philistine going in on all the folk, challenging them, saying, doing this. You know how we used to do. Come on. Come on, this is what he's doing to the whole country. Come on. And all of them sitting back, cowering down, hiding, literally. Hiding. And so David started asking around. He said, what, what, what's up with this? What's, what's going on? What, what's happening with this man? And they told him that he was a champion from the Philistines and he had challenged them. And that our champion could go out and take him. And if so, <clears throat> then we would have them. They would give up. And so he's looking around like, and? One of y'all going to do it? <laughs> and they all looking at him like, we, we scared. Because <laughs> they were. They were afraid. They were fearful. And then the scripture says, David's oldest brother. Eliab saw him talking to people. You need to walk with me on this. Saw him talking to some people at the front line, other soldiers asking them what was going on. And guess what? He got mad. Now, he wasn't mad at the Philistine. He was scared of the Philistine. But he was mad at his little brother who had the audacity to come to the front line. And he said in verse 28, I'm going to jump there. No, I'm going to start at 26. And David said to the men that stood by saying, what shall be done to that man that killed this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered after him saying, so shall it be so shall it be done to the man that killed him. Let me tell you how awful it had gotten. It had gotten so bad that Saul, the king, who was also afraid, had doubled up on his reward for the man who killed Goliath. He said, if you kill the Goliath, not only will I give you, he said, I'll give you three things. He said, I'll give you a daughter. <laughs> I'll give a daughter. I'll let you marry a princess. He said, I'll give you money, I'll make you rich, and I'll give you, look at this, three dimension, I told you you got to study, a tax exemption, which means you won't have to pay taxes on the wealth that I give you, which was which, which valuable. Three things, he said, that I'll give to you if you kill this Philistine. And so David said to, him, to them, he found out from them what was going to happen if they won. And Eliab, verse 28, his eldest brother, heard when David was talking to the men. 
And Eliab's anger, watch this, was kindled against David, not Goliath. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom has those, have, have you left them little few sheep that dad, daddy gave you? So not only did he have to be mad at his brother, he had to denigrate him and talk about it a little, a little bit more. And he said, I know the kind of pride you got, David, and the naughtiness in your heart, because you just came down here thinking you could see us fighting. And David said unto him, what have I done now? That sounds like somebody who's been told a whole lot, you don't do nothing right. So what have I done now? And then he asked the question that I want you to take out of here today. He asked the question, he said, is there not a cause? In other words, don't I have reason to be upset? Don't you have a reason to be upset? Don't you have a reason to be doing something about the circumstances that we now find ourselves in? Is there not a cause when you find yourself in the midst of a giant who seems to be taking over and scaring everybody else? You ought to be able to ask yourself, is there not a cause? Don't I have a reason to be fired up? You got a reason to be fired up. Why are you sitting there like nothing is going on around here? And David, after asking, is there not a cause, made up in his mind that he was going to be the one to make a difference in this circumstance. And when David turned from his brother, he went to Saul the king, and he said to Saul the king, I will remove the reproach from Israel. And I will deal with this Philistine. Now, you would think that David would have been king enough to say, no, nah, David, we can't send you out there. That, that, that Saul would have said to David, we can't send you out there. You're no match for him. But remember, if you don't know Bible, by this time in his, minute, in his kingdom, Saul had already had the Spirit of God removed from him. And so this one who was so promising before, because he had not done what God wanted him to do and because he was crazy, God had removed his spirit from him. And so Saul said to him, not only do I bless you going, I'm going to give you my armor. <laughs> I'm going to give you all of my material so you can go and you can fight him. First thing, sometimes you walk into a conflict. Second thing is, don't forget that sometimes there is a battle before the battle. Let me make, you, make sure you understand this. The battle before the battle is people will misunderstand your purpose. Look at this now. David simply came up there to do his job. Daddy said, bring y'all supplies, I'm bringing you supplies. That's all. I happen to be asking some questions while I'm out here, but really all I'm doing is what Daddy told me to do. He said, but in the midst of dealing with the circumstance that Daddy sent me to, doing my job, I now have to get hate from my brothers. Because you think that I'm here, one, to embarrass you, See, he thought he should, the oldest brother was embarrassed that he didn't have courage enough to go out and fight the Philistine. And because he was embarrassed about that, he thought David's presence was just rubbing salt in the wound that he was too fearful. When you find yourself fighting a battle, people around you will not understand your purpose. Oh yeah, they'll say you just showing out. Yeah, they'll say you just trying to get some attention. Anybody who's ever fought a giant understands the risk involved. You could be taken out by dealing with a giant. Anybody who's foolish enough to go and do it just for attention is a fool. Nobody is going to just go at something this big just so they can get their name in the paper. 
because it's too monumental. Max Lucado wrote it this way, because some of y'all having trouble identifying what a giant is. Some of y'all still thinking about a man wearing armor, a man wearing 150 pounds of armor. You still see your giant like this, but he said it like this, your Goliath doesn't carry a sword and a shield. He brandishes blades of unemployment, abandonment, sexual abuse, or depression. Your giant doesn't parade up and down the hills of the valley of Elah. He prances through your office every morning. He prances through your bedroom every day. He drops you off at work and tells you not to talk to nobody while you're there all day. This is the giant you're dealing with. He brings you bills you can't pay, grades you can't make, people you can't please, whiskey you can't resist, pornography you can't refuse, a career you can't escape, and a past you can't shake, and a future you can't face. This is the kind of giant that folk are dealing with today. No, no, he doesn't have on boots, but he's brutal. He's a bully, and anybody know that a bully is going to demoralize you. Every time they get you in public, they're going to demean you. This is the kind of, of, of giant that we're dealing with today. He might not come riding over the horizon, but you keep looking over your shoulder every day, knowing that he's going to show up. Not only will people misunderstand your purpose when you just walk into a conflict, look at this, conflict will come from those closest to you. The very people who should understand who've been going through something too, who ought to be on your side, those are the ones you catch the most hell from trying to deal with folk. The very ones who ought to be supporting you. Eliab should have been cheering his brother, saying, I I I'm frightened for you, brother, but I'm going to help you in any way I can. Instead, he wasn't looking at the situation from David's point of view. He was looking at it from his own point of view. You're going to make me look bad. you just showing everybody that me and your other brothers are fearful. What are you doing here in the first place? And that's when you got to remember the reason for your battle. This is important. Remember the reason for your battle. The reason the Israelites were so afraid is because they were comparing Goliath's size to their own size. So from that perspective, they were terribly outclassed. Now, in case you think that these folk weren't really huge. If you go back now, you remember in Bible, Joshua and Caleb were sent with 10 other spies to spy out the land that God had promised them. That was, the land that they went into was called the land of Gath. Goliath was from Gath. And so the same giants that the Israelites saw before they went into the promised land one of those giants is standing in front of him right now. And yet, they don't have enough sense to understand that the same God who's already given us the promised land has already shown us we can deal with these giants. They're sitting there quaking in their boots. Remember the reason for your, your battle. New Testament will tell us later that greater is he who's in us than he who's in, he's in the world. Paul later will teach us how to overcome the giants that he had to deal with. In Philippians, he said, I've learned that I need to be content with the stuff that I got. Yeah, I, I know how to live and be poor or to have something. He said, no matter the situation I'm in, I've learned the secret of how to live when I'm full or when I'm hungry, when I got too much or when I have too little. 
When he said, how was I able to do this? He said, I can do all things. All things through Christ who strengthened me. David's eyes weren't on the giant. David's eyes were on the Lord. And remember the reason for the battle. And remember that the battle isn't your battle. It's the Lord's battle. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. David went into the battle saying, I'm not going into this so that at the end of the battle, everybody's going to be saying David's name. I didn't come into it for this. He said, when I defeat this Philistine, when I deal with this circumstance, everybody's going to know that you are the true and living God. The battle's not mine. It's yours. So the first lesson, you, I mean, the lesson you got to learn when you fight battles is to focus on the size of your God and not the size of the giant. Look, 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 look. People get this part wrong, Anthony, all the time, and I won't, I won't. When God brings you to a battle, you're ready. Hear me now. You got to walk with me on this. When, when God brings you to the battle, you are ready. All right? What do you mean? So the thing that David had in his favor, he thought was agility. He was quick. He had learned how to deal with circumstances before. All right? Sometimes our desire to take on the forces that are against us we try to use methods that are not common to us. In fact, what we try to do is match the enemy's activity. So when David decided he was going to go out and be the champion for the Israelites, Saul gave him his armor. He gave him his sword. He gave him all of his equipment to put on. And David sat there and he realized, I can't use this. Right? He said, the Bible said, he said, I have not proven this. In other words, I have not fought with this own before. And because I haven't fought with this own before, I can't use it right now. But watch this. And so he took off all the stuff that Saul gave him. And the Bible says he went down to a brook, a little stream. And he said he went down in the stream and he picked out five smooth stones. Five smooth, this is, where the, this is where the story gets kind of crazy. But I want to bring it home to you and let you know that you got five smooth stones, too. All right? He went and picked out five smooth stones. And he put them in a satchel. And he grabbed a sling that he had been using before. And he went out and he announced to the, to the Goliath, to the champion, that he was ready. And when Goliath saw him, he could barely see him. When he saw him, he laughed at him. He made fun of him. He used a homosexual slur on him. Oh, he did. Go study it. He said, what am I, a dog? That you ought to make fun of me? This is what Goliath said. And that was a term for a male homosexual at the time. That's what he used. This is how he tried to denigrate him. Read the story. Read the word. He used everything he had, and yet David was not flinching. He came out there. And some would ask the question, why did David pick up five stones? Yeah, why did David pick up five stones? She asked me. And the reason he picked up five stones is because Goliath had brothers. Right. Okay. Right. Y'all going to get that. Goliath had brothers, if you don't believe me. If you don't believe me, you heard that. I can give you chapter and verse. Yeah, he had brothers, so he picked up five stones. And in fact, if you go back and you study it, you'll find that later, David and his men took out Goliath's brothers too. Not only did he take care of him that day, but the Bible tells us clearly in 2 Samuel, not 1 Samuel, that they went in and dealt with his brothers 
chapter 21, verses 18, 18 through 22, listed all the brothers and which one of David and his men took them out. And so all he was ready for all of them. But he first had to deal with the first one. Now, let me, let me get this point to you because this is important. When God puts you in a battle, you're already ready. What you have already been doing is the training for what you need to do. Y'all don't hear me. What you have been doing is the training for what you need to do. If you just do your job. The problem is too many people get a job and they try to do somebody else's job. instead of concentrating on their own job. See, David was just a shepherd. He became the best shepherd he could be. That's all he did. And when you're a shepherd, things try to come get your sheep. And in becoming the best shepherd he could be, David learned how to take a smooth rock and a slingshot and kill a bear. Yeah. He learned how to kill a lion. Just being the best shepherd he could be. He wasn't trying to be a warrior. He was trying to be a shepherd. Too many folk are hired as an uh, administrative assistant and they try to be the CEO. Just be the best administrative assistant you can be. Because what you learn as an administrative assistant is gonna help you when you become a CEO. You don't hear me on this. We got too many CEOs who don't know how to be administrative assistants. They don't have no compassion when it comes to being an administrative assistant because they never did that job before. Just do your job. Now, make it right, Andre. Look, all David needed to know how to do when he stood in that valley was throw a stone. But he wouldn't know how to throw a stone if he hadn't been a shepherd. All right. All right. He wouldn't know about protecting his flock yeah. if he hadn't been a shepherd. And all Israelites, all of Israel was his flock that day. And I just came to protect my flock. And you the bear that's trying to get to my flock. And so the same rock that I used to get rid of that, that bear that was trying to get to my sheep I'm using the same rock, the same technique, the same equipment, the same is what you're going to use to deal with the circumstances. Ain't no preparation. People want to get prior preparation for being awesome. When you get there, you use what you got. If you've done what you're supposed to do, then you'll have all you need. Look, 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 I wonder what would have happened if David had gone on monster.com and filled out an application to become a giant slayer. There's no such thing. Because you don't understand that sometimes you walk into a battle. You can't prepare yourself, but that doesn't mean you're not prepared. If you utilize what God has done for you, then you're ready for the battle. So David slings the rock. And it wasn't his quickness that got him. It was the fact that God steadied his hand and allowed that stone to hit Goliath in a place where he was vulnerable. And the Bible says that it hit him in his head, he died. And David immediately got rid of him, ran up, took his sword, took his head, and the battle was over. And here comes what happens after you. See, if you've done what you need to do, 
then you're supposed to declare yourself the victor. No, when it's the Lord's battle, right. you need to know that things don't always happen afterward like you think they're going to. Yeah. All of the Philistines were supposed to become their slaves. Problem is, when David did his thing, all of them ran away and refused to do what they promised they would do from Goliath, which is why they ended up having to track them down and get rid of all of them. When God brings you to the battle, you're already battle ready. Don't get ahead of the battle by trying to fight. Look at this. David said, is there not a cause? Do you have a cause today? Do you have somebody that's been messing with you? Somebody who's been bothering you? Somebody who fits in one of those categories? I'm telling you right now, don't try to fight that battle by yourself. David didn't go into the Valley of Elah by himself. David went into the Valley of Elah to prove that the true and living God was in fact the true and living God. He knew him before, watch this, he entered the valley. And so knowing him before he entered the valley meant he went into the valley with the power of God behind him. My question to you today is, if you've got a cause, do you know the Lord? David returned from killing the Philistine after winning what can only be considered a great victory. In fact, it led to Saul ultimately leaving the kingdom, well, dying, because Saul became jealous of David after that and tried to kill him after the fight was over. Both David and Jesus Christ, the one who we serve, represent situations that are unique. Both of them represented their people. Both of them were representative of what happened to God's people. Look at this. Both David and Jesus fought the battle on ground that rightfully belonged to God's people. David fought on behalf of folks who should have been fighting for themselves. Jesus came and fought a battle for folk who by right should have been fighting for themselves. That's me and you. We both had lost ground. The Israelites had lost ground. Mankind had lost ground. You and I owed a debt that we couldn't pay. And so Jesus Christ came to fight for us. Both David and Jesus fought when the enemy was able to dominate people. We feel like that right now, that the enemy is just all about us, just dominating everything. We feel like that. But can I tell you that Jesus has already paid the price that needs to be paid to deal with all the enemies we have. The question is, do we trust him? In order to lead us into those battles. David and Jesus were both sent to a battleground by their father. Just like David went to the battleground from his daddy, Jesus was sent here on this battleground by his father. David and Jesus both were rejected by their brethren. Just like... David's brothers rejected him. The same thing happened to Jesus Christ. He was rejected by his brothers and by others as well. Both David and Jesus fought the battle without any concern about human strategies or conventional wisdom. In other words, they didn't have this well thought out plan when they came. They just came to love folk and to take care of them. David and Jesus both won the battle. But then they saw, even after they won that battle, that their enemies did not give up willingly. Oh yeah, the devil is still busy, y'all. Even though Jesus Christ has paid it all, the enemy's still everywhere. David and Jesus fought a battle where victory was assured even before the battle started. Why? Because neither of the battles they fought was theirs. They were fighting on behalf of the Lord. And so both of them had what I call a, a nevertheless. A nevertheless mindset. Even though they came in and victory wasn't assured, nevertheless they went forward. Even though they didn't have 
what other people would say would be the equipment that they needed, nevertheless, they went forward. Even though people will get in your ear and tell you you're nothing, you're worthless, nevertheless, I came to tell you that you're valuable in Jesus' eyesight. Even though you might be the least in your family, nevertheless, God has something special planned for you. Even though you came in here today thinking you were coming to get a good meal on the parking lot, nevertheless, I came to tell you, you had to get some spiritual food before you could go get our physical food. Even though no man is perfect, David ended up being a man who would commit some awful crimes, do some awful things. Nevertheless, God called him a man after his own heart. God allows us to mess up, and then God allows us to be forgiven. And so somebody came here today, and they know Jesus, but they messed up. Can I tell you, he's perfect for folk who mess up. He doesn't expect perfection from us, but what he does expect from us is confession. If you messed up, just tell the Lord, I messed up and I need to be back with you, Lord. Today is my day. I need to straighten things out with you. I'm tired of being on the outside. Don't keep trying to fight this giant in your life by yourself. Let the Lord fight your battles for you. I've been waiting on you. I've been watching you go through life. I've been knowing that you need to have somebody to walk with you and talk to you and support you. But I need you to take that first step. I need you to accept the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ has given. And if you've already accepted salvation, then we need to be in fellowship with one another. So I'm asking you, is today the day that 45th Street becomes your church family? I can't think of a better day. Family, friends are here welcoming you in. Choir's going to stand and sing this song right now. And while they do, the same Jesus Christ who died for you has empowered me to invite you to become a part of his family. The doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, let them come right now. Right now.